Well, we do come this morning to celebrate the Lord's Supper, and the entire service has been aimed around that. I do appreciate Brother Carlos and your praise team, instrumentalists. Uh, I believe they, they work together and come in harmony in such a way that it produces a, a wonderful introduction to the studying of God's Word. Thank you for your sensitivity and, and the quality of your music and, uh, and uh, the way that all the instruments and the singers work together. I appreciate the practices that you all put in to be able to bring that all. As we come together to worship the Lord this morning, uh, I'll, I've designed the, the seating arrangement, as I told you before, in the fashion in which they had that first Lord's Supper. As we uh, think about the Lord's Supper, we know that there's a, there's a juice which re, uh, reminds us of the blood of Jesus Christ. When I think about the blood of Jesus Christ at, at the, the Lord's Supper, I'm reminded of the, of the pastor's home one day when the pastor wasn't home yet and and the little boy in the family was concerned about his dad. He knew that he came in at a certain time of the day. And uh, he asked mom, he says, Mom, where's dad? He should be home by now. Is he out visiting the people that are sick in the hospitals and things like that? Is that why he's late? And his mom said, No, son, he stopped today to give blood. The little boy thought for a few moments and he thought blood. And he said, Mom, it really is grape juice that we use at the Lord's Supper, not blood, right? <laughs> Yes, it's grape juice that we use at the Lord's Supper uh, that symbolizes, that reminds us of the blood of Jesus Christ. You know, when I, I stop and think about this, I'm reminded uh, about the fact that, that Jesus died for us and shed His blood so that we might have forgiveness of sin. There's a purpose in all of this, of course. And, uh, you know, when I stop and think about the Lord's Supper, I'm reminded of the background as to the kind of things that went along in front of that and what it meant uh, when the Lord's uh, Supper was uh, first instituted. As we think about the Lord's Supper, it's a, it's a reminder of the fact that when the early church began to celebrate the Lord's Supper, as we will do this morning, they began to abuse the Lord's Supper. And we've set up this morning to help us think about what that is. When you normally come to the, to the Lord's Supper, Many times it's the part that's done at the end of the service, uh, and it's a separate part really from the sermon and the invitation and all of that. And the Lord's Supper is, is, uh, is talked about more at that time, but today I want to just set the whole service to be around the Lord's Supper as we think about it. And, and what the church would do when they came in, in that early Corinthian church, what they would do when they'd come in, they would bring food with them. It was a type of potluck fellowship, if you please, and everybody would bring their favorite dishes and all that, and they would sit down, and, and they would put them like we do many times at the back. They would put them up on common tables, and everybody would go by and choose what they want and uh, get a chance to eat other people's dishes, you know, and always bring enough of the food that they brought so that everybody could share and get to taste their dishes, and it was kind of a, a big deal. And uh, they would uh, take and come in and enjoy a fellowship together. And, and many times uh, in my church life, we've been in churches in which, like on Wednesday night, they would come together and have a fellowship meal. And, and you go through the line and get your food and then sit down and eat. And then you would go into the worship center and have a worship service. But in the Corinthian church, they did it like we are set up here this morning. They would have their tables and everything set up in the worship format. Uh, but at the same time also a fellowship format. And as uh, they came in, they would begin to eat. But it got to be where the wealthier people in the congregation, that's one of the beautiful things about the Christian church, is you have different social groups in the church. Um, in, in our church here, we've had everything from people that are destitute, that, that don't have enough money to buy food from payday to payday, and all the way up to, at one point, we had a millionaire, a multimillionaire in our church. And the people in the church had no way of knowing who was the, the poor person and who was the millionaire that was in our church. And certainly we've had other people that made into the hundreds of thousands of dollars in our fellowship. And in the true sense of the Christian church, nobody knows those things. Nobody knows who is at what social level uh, in society. Because that's the way it should be in Christian fellowship. But in the Corinthian church that we look at today and found in 1 Corinthians 11... Paul was speaking to the Corinthian church because they had become at the point to where they were beginning to differ in the way they treated one another because of their social status. It was that they would come in and, and, and a, a wealthy family would come in and they would bring their food and instead of placing it in the back in the common area, they would take their food to their own table. 
And then they were there and they would enjoy uh, eating their own food while there were people that came in that were poor that didn't have anything to bring and they came in just for the worship service and they didn't have any food to come in and since there was no food left back in the back because people were taking their own sandwiches and their own uh, different things that they brought and taking it to their table, there was no food left for them. So while some were gorging on the food and, and drinking and even getting drunk in the, in the fellowship before the worship service, there were other people there that were still hungry and uh, enjoying the fellowship with people, but they had no food to eat. And so Paul wrote to them in chapter 11, verse 17, and uh, follow along with me as I'll put up the words up on the screen. Now in giving you these instructions, Paul said, as I write this to you, I want you to understand, as Brother Rich Holly read earlier, I want you to understand that I'm not praising you in what you're doing. Since you're coming together, not for the better, not coming together for the the worship of God and coming better for the better, better reason, but instead you're coming together for the worse. And I want to begin, I want you to hear what I'm saying. As I write there as a church, there are divisions among you. You're separating yourselves out into social classes and you're taking, and instead of being one fellowship united together in love and for the Lord Jesus Christ and for each other, there are divisions in you. And Paul says, I'm not only being told this, but I believe it. And then in verse 19, he says, there must indeed be factions among you, it's different uh, social groups, divisions among you, so that that those that are approved may be recognized among you. You're sitting with those you're trying to impress. You're, sitting, you're talking and, and fellowshipping with those that you're trying to impress and be impressed by rather than taking and coming together to worship the Lord. And therefore, when you come together, you're not coming together for the Lord's Supper. You're coming together for a whole wrong reason. In verse 21, for at the meal, that's the fellowship that existed before the, the Lord's Supper. For at the meal, each one has his own supper ahead of others, so that one person is hungry while another gets drunk, gorging himself. Don't you have houses in which you can eat and drink in and and partake of the food that you want to and gorge yourself on it there? Don't you have your own homes that you can do this in? Why do you come to the church of the Lord and do this and then look down upon the church of God and embarrass those who have absolutely nothing among you? What should I say to you? Should I praise you? No, Paul says, I don't praise you for this at all. May we go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we come today to look and remember the the initiation of the Lord's Supper and then to partake in the Lord's Supper this morning, I pray, Lord, that you would speak to us in such a way that we would uniquely understand those things in our life that are repulsive to you, those things that are in our life, Lord, that, that are distracting our witness and not allowing people to see Jesus in us. I pray, Father, that you would take and work in our hearts this morning, that we would come to confess those things to you and repent of them, turn away from them, and begin to do the things that allow your Holy Spirit in us to witness other people and to bring other people into the kingdom of God, and that we too might be able to draw close to you in worship. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as we see this, it was a mockery the way they were doing it in church. And Paul wrote to them, and in this 1 Corinthians 11, he gives four things. One, two, three, four. I got them right. Four things. I had to make sure I had four fingers up there. One, two, three, four points that I want to use today to help us as we look at this passage to understand those. And they're actually in four verses to keep it simple for us. The first one is that when they started the the Lord's Supper, when Jesus sat down with His disciples, and of course there were twelve disciples, and they sat down around the couches there, the table around them, and they had the Passover meal. And it was at that Passover meal that they finished eating the Passover meal. It was at that point that Jesus turned to Judas and said, Judas, go and do the thing that you've got to do. This is the time for you to do it. And He gave him a piece of bread... And he ate the bread as they had eat there, the, uh, the Passover meal together, the fellowship meal, if you please. And they uh, took and uh, dismissed Judas, and Judas left. Now, the rest of the disciples did not know where Judas was going. They assumed that since he was the treasure, he sat right on the left side of Jesus, that, that he was going to do something for Jesus, that Jesus had told him to take the money and go and prepare something or get something done for the disciple band. So they thought nothing of it as Judas left the disciple band. 
But Jesus is now there with 11 of his disciples, and Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper. He begins the Lord's Supper. And as we look at this today, we see that that the Lord's Supper had historical significance to it. It was, a, it was not just something that came out. It had historical significance to it. You see, as we think about that first word, their historical origin, as we think about that found in the, the 23rd verse, we see that it all began with something that actually happened in history. This is not just a story. The Bible's not full of stories about things that people made up. The Bible is full about actual historical events that happened. And this was a historical event. And Paul is talking about, in this particular one, uh, the fact that there was a certain man that instituted this. That certain man, as we look at verse 23, uh, the certain man was Jesus Christ. As we think about verse 23... The first verse there, it says, And for I received from the Lord, from Jesus Himself, what also was passed on to you, that on the night when He was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread. So as we look at this verse, the first thing we see is that it was historical. It actually happened because there was a certain man. There was Jesus Christ. It also was a certain night. It was on the night that Jesus would be betrayed. Many times people, uh, on the very day that Jesus would be betrayed, many times people don't stop and think about the significance of when Jesus was betrayed. It was on the very day that Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. You say, well, now hold it, Pastor. Didn't the supper occur at night? Yes, it did. Now, in Jewish time, uh, supper, uh, de- uh, a new day began at 6 p.m., around dusk. Actually, not 6 p.m. by the watch, but 6 p.m. by dusk, when the sun would set, that was called dusk, and that would begin a new day. The particular day was called the 14th of Nisan. Uh, And this year, in uh, 2014, the 14th of Nisan, which is a Hebrew calendar, uh, coincided with our April 1st. And uh, it changes each year. It has to do with the uh, the moon that occurs after the, the summer equinox, and when the summer equinox occurs, they look for the first moon that will occur after that. And when the first moon takes and breaks the sky, they say that now, the, when, when it goes dusk, when the sun goes down, that that will be the 14th of, uh, that will be the first of Nisan. And as they look at that, and they go forward, then you go on out uh, for 14 days, and that's when they're going to have the first, uh, remember, the uh, Lord's Supper. So it was actually a certain man, it was a certain night, and it was this night in which Jesus is going to be betrayed. So after 6 o'clock, they sat down and had the Passover meal, which was a meal that all Jews uh, uh, honored. And in Judaism, they they continue to honor that today. And it's the time when they remember back to the time that when God told Moses, I want you to go and bring my people out of Israel, out of uh, Egypt, where they're slaves. I want you to bring them out of there, and I want you to bring them to a new land that I'm giving you, and that land would be called Israel. And it's a land that's flowing with milk and honey. It was a land in which was uh, there was plenty of vegetation, there was plenty of moisture, and it would be a land in which they would be able to farm and, and do all the things that they wanted to do. And as God spoke to Moses and says, I want you to do this, Moses, of course, brought up the fact that the Pharaoh was not going to be favorable toward this, that Pharaoh would not want the people to leave. So he told Moses, I'll give you some signs, I'll give you some miracles that will be performed through you that will cause the Pharaoh to want to release you. So his Passover is the significance of this. We see that, that Moses did these things. And, and on that particular night when uh, they, uh, they did this, which happened to be the 14th of Nisan, when the when God took and did the tenth miracle, the tenth miracle, it was a sign in which God would take and protect them. And the tenth miracle was going to be when He sent the tenth plague. The tenth plague that would convince Pharaoh to release the Israelites and no longer have them a slave, but to release them to go and to worship their God. That was the night that He told him that the firstborn of every home in the land would lose their son. Their firstborn son would be killed, and the death angel would come over, and that child would die that night. But he told his people, if they would take 
and take a paschal lamb, a lamb that they would take, a perfect lamb, and they would take this lamb and their, or goat or whatever, and they would take and sacrifice this goat, and there was a procedure for how they were to do that. Every family group was to do this. They would take and they would spill the blood out, and then the blood would take, and they would take a hyssop, or a paintbrush if you please, and they would take and they would paint this on the doorpost of their house and on the lintel, And as that blood was on the door, when the death angel flew over that night, anyone that believed God and did what God said, in other words, painted the blood on the doorpost of that lamb, that that house would be spared and there would be no death in it. This was tremendous. Can you imagine your firstborn child? That that you wake up the next morning on the 14th of Nisan, you wake up and remember... The 14th of Nisan, a day began at 6 o'clock at night, and the next morning would still be the 14th of Nisan because a day didn't go from morning to night. A day went from 6 o'clock in the evening till 6 o'clock the next day. So the 14th of Nisan, you would, you would, you would go to bed having painted on your house, and then you would wake up the next morning still the same day, and you would realize that your child was dead. And the only way you could prevent this was to believe God so much that you would make a mockery of yourself, that you would take and allow people to laugh at you, that you would so be in tune with God that God said it, that settles it, I'll do it, that you would put blood on the doorpost of your house and on the lintel. The Egyptians would laugh at you and call you a fool. Who do you think you are anyway? But the next morning, all that did not believe God woke up and they found that their child... Whatever age that child was, their firstborn was dead. Even the Pharaoh's child was dead. But not one single person that believed God and did what God said woke up and found their child dead. God literally passed over their house and saved their child. And so when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, it was at one of those Passover meals that they had been celebrating. And they, they all came together and as a family unit. And Jesus and His family, the church family, if you please. That's when the church family comes together. Sometimes people say, well, you give me the Lord's Supper over at my house. I say, no, I can't do that. I'm sorry. It's not something that I can do. It's, it's an ordinance that God gave to the church. It's to the family that God gave it. It's not to your natural family. It's to your family that God gave you, the church. It's an ordinance that the church is only able to do. It makes a mockery of it when we do it aside from the the Lord Jesus Christ church. Now the church family might be just two or three people. It might even just be a household in a land where there are no other Christians around. Or maybe in in a foreign land you might take and two or three families come together as they did in those early days. And and you have a church there in your home as you come together like that because there is no local church that you can go to. may even be a danger to your life and the life of those that you're witnessing to. But it's a church ordinance. As the church comes together that night, Jesus and His disciples, they take and they eat the Passover meal. Now Jesus at that meal says, this is the last time I'll do this until I enter the kingdom of God. Jesus says, I'll no longer eat the Passover meal with you until I'm in the kingdom of God. One glorious day, Jesus is going to come back and take His bride to Himself And we're going to all live together in the kingdom of heaven. We'll be there with God. And Jesus will be there with us. And we can celebrate all the miracles that God has done for us in our life, including the Passover meal. But Jesus said, I'll never do this again. I'll never do this again until that glorious time comes again. So we don't celebrate the Passover meal as Christians because Jesus said we'd wait until that time when we were all physically together again. But we do remember that Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper at Passover meal. So we still have fellowship meals. We still come together and we fellowship. And, and at the fellowship meal that night, they, they took and they ate the, the Passover meal. And as they ate the Passover meal, they all sit there and shared with what they had. You saw in the picture where the bread was there. That was part of the Passover meal. And there was vegetables and all kinds of different stuff. And Jesus would take and break it. And that's the reason you see that Jesus gave the bread. If you watch different movies about the Passover meal, you'll see that Jesus shared the meal that night with Judas. He was part of the family. 
He happened to be a devil. He happened to allow the devil to control his life. He was a person that had never truly come underneath the Lordship of Jesus Christ as his pastor. He had never come under the Lordship of Jesus Christ as he would later find out that Jesus was very God. And that night, Jesus and Jesus had a meal together. And then Jesus excused him. And after he excused him from the fellowship, then Jesus would institute a new covenant. The first covenant was the covenant of the Passover. The blood that was spilt on the house by painting it on that with the hyssop. Jesus would institute a new, whole new covenant. And He would do it this time, not with a hyssop, but He would do it with His very body on the very 14th of Nisan, the very night that He instituted the Lord's Supper, on the very 14th of Nisan, oh yes, it would be after the sun went down and the sun came back up, but it was still the 14th of Nisan. On that very 14th of Nisan, a real man, a certain man, Jesus Christ, on a certain event that night when He did that, in which He was betrayed, we see that it is a certain event that took place and Jesus took the bread that night and symbolized it and He said, this bread reminds you from now on of My body. And as He broke the bread and divided it and gave each a piece of it, He was reminding them that He personally was dying for their sins and for them. If you're a Christian tonight, if you made Jesus the Lord of your life, if you said to the world, I don't care what you say, if it disagrees with what Jesus tells me, I'm going to obey Jesus. He's the Lord of my life. And you've invited Jesus into your life as your Lord. Then He's your Savior. Some people want to make Him their Savior. They want to, they want to buy, get a free ticket to heaven from Jesus, but they don't want to make Him the Lord of their life. That's not Christianity. Christianity is making Jesus your Lord. That if you believe in your heart, that God raised Jesus from the dead, and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that He's your Lord, then you will be saved, the Bible tells us. It's not by baptism. It's not by church membership. Those are important ways of identifying that we are a Christian. It's not by taking the Lord's Supper. This is a great way to remember what the Lord did for you. But it is by believing in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. That He is very God Himself. Always has been God. Always will be God. He is very God and He's alive today. In Jehovah's Witnesses, great people and they have a, a tremendous way of worshiping and, and, and a great religion. But unfortunately, they, understand, they do not understand the Jesus of the Bible. Their Jesus is a person who God took and made a God. Their Jesus is not the God that we believe in. Their Jesus is not one who, who died for our saved our sins and ascended into heaven back to where He came from. Theirs is one which God created. And put here on this earth. And He died and He went back to, and He went to heaven. But our Jesus is a different Jesus than the Jehovah Witnesses Jesus. Their Jesus was created by God. The Jesus of the Bible was not created by God, for it says in John 1.1 1, 1, that in the beginning God, uh, that God created the heavens and the earth, and that all that was created was created by Jesus. Jesus was the agent of creation. It's not the same Jesus as the Mormons worship. The Mormons have a great religion and they, they have great family life and, and great morals, and, and I admire their, their morals. But their Jesus is a different Jesus than the Jesus of, of Christianity. Their Jesus is a Jesus that, that God created and that God took and placed here on the earth. And they believe that God is, is Elohim, that's His name, and that He's married to Mother uh, God. And that they have a planet out there, Kebab I believe is the name of it, and that on that planet they had sons. Two of the sons that they had, one of them was Jesus, one of them was Satan, and that they took and they sent Jesus to this earth to be the God of this earth. That's not the same God that we believe in. They believe that God, Jesus Christ, is a created being, and that He is just a man that did what God wanted Him to do, and as a result, that He has a, 
a place now in God, Elohim's universe. That earth is His place of rule. We don't believe that. We believe what the Bible says, and that is that Jesus Christ created all that there was, all that there is today, and that Jesus was God and existed in the Garden of Eden. It says in the Garden of Eden that there Jesus took and He came to Adam and Eve. It talks about Jesus coming and speaking to Moses. It talks about Jesus in many different things. They, they see Jesus as the Michael, the archangel that, uh, that God had created and placed in the garden. And they, they see Michael, the archangel, as, as rising to the status of a god. That's not the Jesus that I'm talking about this morning. The God that I'm talking about this morning, Jesus Christ, claimed that He is the great I Am. That He is the one who, when Moses says, Who are you? God answered him back and He says, I am. I am anything you want to say. I am the one who created the world. I am the one who existed before existence was here. Jesus, God in the flesh, came down and He dwelt among us. God Himself. And He instituted that night on the 14th of Nisan, a fellowship that we would continue to do, which was the greatest fellowship among God's people that has ever existed. Much greater than the Passover. And Jesus instituted that night a celebration of the fact that He would be the blood that was spilled. And on the 14th of Nisan, as we turn to the morning of the 14th of Nisan, and we, we see Jesus being tried falsely and, and things being done against Him because Judas betrayed Him and because others turned against Him too and even His disciples didn't stand with Him, we see Jesus as He goes to the cross and He dies. And there on the cross, His blood is spilled. And a new covenant comes about. Not the covenant of blood on the doorpost that we remembered in Passover, but now the blood of God Himself as a human being being spilled on the ground and on the cross for my sins and for your sins and for the sins of every single person that's ever lived or ever will live. Yes, historical, a certain man, a certain night, a certain event. And also then, we see that it's a gift. When we look at the 24th verse, we see that it's not only a historical event, but it's actually a gift from God that He gave. A gift from God. Jesus becomes the Lamb. He is the very Lamb. In the, in the old day, in the Passover, they would take and pick a perfect Lamb. Jesus becomes our Lamb. Instead of taking a lamb, and, and we don't do that anymore, obviously we don't, because Jesus gave His own body to be our lamb. He is the perfect lamb of God. And as we look in this verse, we see that Jesus is a gift from God. Read with me in the 24th verse, it says here. In the 24th verse, we read, it says, Give thanks because broke. He broke it. And then He said, This is my body which is for you, do this in remembrance of me. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ did not bring a lamb that night. They had lamb in the uh, Passover meal. And then Jesus said, I'll no longer take of this until I'm in the kingdom of heaven. And then He instituted a new covenant. A new covenant. That's why we call the first part the old covenant. And the new part of the Bible, the new covenant, because the new covenant, the New Testament, testament meaning covenant or contract, the new covenant talks about what Jesus did for us. In the old covenant, it talks about what God did for us as He instituted Passover and showed us what was going to happen when He would come in human flesh. So we see here that it's a wonderful thing that God has done for us. It is actually a gift to us. And then third, we see that it is a celebration of the new covenant. It is a celebration of the new covenant. No longer is there a lamb to be sacrificed. The Lamb of God Himself, Jesus Christ, has been sacrificed. And when we come together, we take and we look at the bread because Jesus said it symbolizes His body. We see it as Him. It's not His body. 
It symbolizes His body. When we see the juice, the red color reminds us it's not His blood. It symbolizes His blood was shed for us. What do we do? Well, what we're to do is we're to, to proclaim not only the death of Jesus Christ, but we're to proclaim salvation to every single person. This is our responsibility. The fourth thing, the, the three things that I've told you about today, number one is that it's historical, it actually happened. Number two, it's a gift from God. Jesus gave Himself. And number three, it's a celebration of a new covenant, a new relationship between us and God. But four, it is a time for us to proclaim salvation. Salvation. What does salvation mean? It means that we have been saved, not by the blood of animals, but we have been saved by the precious blood of God Himself, as Jesus Christ gave His life for us. I want to take and come to this time with you of celebrating the Lord's Supper today. And as we do this, I want you to be reminded of the fact that, that this is the time that we need to be prepared. There was a sign up in, a, in a, uh, one of these uh, offices where they take and, and the government tries to help you to find a job. And the sign that was up there says, Would you hire you? And so that each of the people that came in looking for unemployment, they would have to go out and look for a job. And, and there was a full-length mirror there. And as the people would get up to go to, 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 to sign up, they would come to this mirror and they would see in the mirror this sign that said, Would you hire you? And you actually see a picture of yourself as you look there. And what it was saying is, you may not have a job because of the way you look. You may not have a job because of the attitude that you have. You may not have a job because would you hire the person that you're looking at in the mirror to go to work for you if you had the business? And so when we come to the Lord's Supper, the Bible doesn't say that God's going to examine us life. One day God will judge us. It doesn't say the church is to judge us because the church has no right to judge people. We... We take and judge in our congregation if someone's done something that, that would cause them to lose fellowship in the church or, or cause them to have to repent. But we don't take and judge people by their moral standards in the church. This is not our job. That is the job of God when He comes back. But my dear friend, the Bible tells us we're to judge ourselves. We're to stand in front of the mirror of the Word of God, the Bible itself. And as we look at it, we're to ask the question, if you were God, would you accept you? into the kingdom of God. And I have to clearly say, I would not accept me. But Jesus said, I wouldn't either stand, but because of Jesus, I accept Him, and He invites you into the kingdom of God. You see, it's not by your goodness or by your works, but it's by the gift of Jesus Christ dying and paying for your sins that we're accepted by God. So when we come to the Lord's Supper today, we're to take it in a worthy manner, the Bible says. It does not say we're to be worthy people for we're not worthy at all. But we're to take it in a worthy manner. And that's why Paul wrote to the church and said, how is it that you come together for the Lord's Supper and in the fellowship you distinguish among each other because of social standing? Something's wrong with that. You're the family of God. None of you deserve to be in the family of God. Only by the grace of Jesus Christ and the gift of Jesus can you be in the family of God. You're making a mockery of what follows that fellowship. You're making a mockery of the Lord's Supper. So as we come this morning, we're to examine ourselves. I'm going to ask you if you'll bow your head at this time. And in the quietness of your own mind, I want you now to go to God. And I want you to confess to God three sins. And if you're like me, you'll have a hard time limiting it to three. Three sins that you're doing right now, things that you're doing that are breaking the heart of God. Confess to God right now three things. You can confess more as I had to. And now... Tell God you want to repent. Tell God you want to change that. You don't want to do those things anymore. You want to be different. The Bible says that when we repent, God is just and He's willing to forgive us. 
you can come worthy because of what Jesus Christ has just done in your life. Heavenly Father, I thank You this morning for this time of fellowship and thank You time for this time of worship. Now as we come together to remember what You did for us on that night when You instituted the Lord's Supper and what You did the 14th of Nisan, that, as that day continued as You went to the cross for us. And then what You did three days later when You rose from the dead and said, It's paid for. It's over. The debt is paid. That, Lord, our debt has been paid for. Bless us today in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing a song of invitation. And as we do, it's a song inviting you to come. Let Jesus be the Lord of your life. Would you stand together with me? And as we sing, would you take and come? If you want to give your life to Jesus, you come. the men if they'd come forward at this time to help. As we come to the Lord's Supper, this is a wonderful time. This is a time in which we remember what all God has done. And as these ordained men come forward this morning, I want to ask them if they would take and serve the Lord's Supper this morning. So if you would uncover the table, come on down, my brother. Go ahead and uncover This morning as we come to the Lord's table, as Jesus did that night, we're going to take and we're going to use the juice this morning. The juice is it's grape juice. It was on that night, it was wine. It was a, a red in color. And as we look at the color, it reminds us of the blood of Jesus that would be spilt the next day. And then as we look at the bread, the bread that night was uh, probably not this shape. But it was bread, it was just broken up, and it was given so that it would remind the people of Jesus' body that was broken that night. I'm going to ask the men now if they will pass among you. And if you've given your life to Jesus and He's the Lord of your life, please take of the elements today. And if you'll pass this to your brother there. And now I'd like for you to take and pass among the people. And if you'll go upstairs and take care of them and pat and uh, pass among the people and make sure that everybody is served this morning. As you receive the bread this morning, please keep it. Do not eat it at this time. We'll all eat together. As we read in the Gospel according to Luke, it says, When the hour came, Jesus reclined at the table and the apostles reclined with Him. And then he said to them, I have fervently desired to eat the Passover with you before I suffer. 
For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. That was when he had the Passover meal with them. And then he took the cup. And after giving thanks, he said, Take this and share it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God happens. Still part of the Passover as he shared with them. And then it says he instituted a new ordinance, a new command, a new testament with them. And he took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it to them and said, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then in the same way, he took the cup after supper and he said, This cup is the new covenant established in my blood. It is shed for you. But look to the hand of the one betraying me at the table with me. For the Son of Man will go away. It has been determined. But woe to the man to whom he is betrayed. And they begin to argue among themselves which of them it could be. Who is going to do this thing? And then a dispute arose among them about who should be considered the greatest. One of the things that happened at that first Lord's Supper is that they were concerned about themselves and concerned about who would sit at the right hand and the left hand of Jesus Christ. If there's anyone that's not been served, please raise your hand so one of these men can bring it to you. If you've not been served, please raise your hand so they can come to you. Over here, this side of the house. And so we come together and today to receive the remembrance of what Jesus did for us. And then it says they took the cup and they passed it among us. So I'm going to give you the cup and please keep it with the bread and we will take and eat it together. During this time would be a good time to just reflect on that prayer that you had a while ago. How you named your sins and how you asked the Lord to allow you to repent, to turn away from that, doing those things and to do differently. If there's never been a time in your life in which you've made Jesus the Lord of your life in which you've said, Jesus, you're God. And from now on, what you say is what I'm going to do. That's what the Bible is, is God speaking to us. It's the very words of God written through men, women as they took and wrote down what God spoke to them, inspired by them, the actual words of God. And on this side over here, brother. And then remember to tell the Lord that your desire Repentance, that your desire is to turn away from those things and to do different, and to do what God tells you to do. As the disciples were around the tables that night and they received the Lord's Supper, a new ordinance replacing Passover for Christians, they instituted a new way of remembering the Lord God for what he had done, no longer remembering the great miracle that he passed over their homes and didn't kill their firstborn child, but now remembering that he passed over their lives and he would remember their sins no more. They took the bread. 
I had a prayer. I'm going to ask if my brother Gloria, another pastor, if he would take and lead us in this prayer as we remember the broken body of uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. the bread together and then they took the cup I'm going to ask Brother Bill if he and other pastor would take and lead us in this prayer as we remember the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for us together. Would you stand together with us to sing? What's the name of that song? Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, oh, how I love Jesus. One more time. Oh, how I love Jesus. And why do you love Him? Because He first. Love me. Thank you, Lord. 